Welcome to This Week in Money. I'm Jim Goddard. Today, CIBC Wood Gundy's Ross Clark on the sudden rise of the Swiss franc. Morgan Report founder David Morgan points out low oil prices could bust banks. And James Corbett from the International Forecaster explores how China's economy could affect B.C. real estate. We talk to Ross Clark right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome to This Week in Money, the source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. Welcome back to This Week in Money, Ross. Always a pleasure to be with you. What is happening on our markets and what's caught your attention? Well, you know, uh, we thought volatility was uh, fairly big uh, the early part of the year and expanding. This week, um, the the action that we had on the currency side with the Swiss deciding that they were going to forego the peg against the euro and drop interest rates to minus three quarters of a percent. Just uh, the shock waves on uh, Thursday were very big in the marketplace. Uh, you ended up with a, a 15% overnight move in the Swiss franc, tacked on another couple of percent at the end of the week. So overall, a 17% move in the Swiss against the euro. And with that, um, it had implications um Money moving around in Europe, uh, clearly the German market uh, appre- uh, saw appreciation in terms of their stocks as people are wondering how long can the euro eventually hold together. And if you've got money in euros, you know, uh, maybe you'd rather have it in Germany so when the euro is gone, you've got a German currency. So you have that happening over on the European side of the equation. And um, all around the world, um, the gold market appreciated um, as Europeans were looking for more and more safe havens, so they moved to bullion, they moved to U.S. dollars, and uh, they were moving to uh, the U.S. bond market again. And what does that do to the equity market? Uh, equity markets, um, fairly big action uh, yesterday, uh, being on uh, on Thursday, markets uh, came under pressure. But they uh, appear to have finally uh, shaken off. We had five bad days in a row. Ended up the week uh, up about uh, one, one and a half percent uh, in the Dow, the S&P, uh, on the day. Still down on the year. Uh, still down a good uh, close to two percent uh, on the um, the Dow, and um, about the same on the S&P. Um, saw some stability start to kick in, as I say, at the tail end of the week. Um, I had been looking at the Russell 2000. We talked about that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it's uh, it's just managing to hold support, still thinking it's got a chance to uh, retest the highs. Ross, you were saying that some of the stuff that we're talking about, you have charts for us? Yes. Um, I've got uh, some charts on uh, uh, the U.S. dollar index, uh, which has uh, continued to just barrel along on the upside, trading around the, the 92 and a half range right now. And I'm still of the mindset that 92 to 94 is uh, is a pretty decent uh, resistance level from which uh, we can uh, see a pause uh, in this rally. Hopefully it's a little bit more than a pause and a, and a bit of a correction there. Um, also have uh, some charts on the uh, the gold market, the gold-silver ratio, which I think is really interesting here. Um, we had uh, uh, talked at uh, the end of uh, uh, the year as to the fact that the, the miners, following the tax selling pressure into the 24th and 26th of December, once that tax selling pressure was over, the miners started to show good resiliency and putting in higher lows while the bullion, silver and gold, were still inching down. And as we turned the corner there, right at the end of the year, uh, we started to see, say, the miners outperforming silver and silver outperforming gold. And that's that's the equation that, that you like to see in the mining, in the, um, the precious metals coming off a low. And that continued right through the first week of the month. Um, and uh, then this week, with the surge that we've seen, um, silver settled back um, in terms of its performance relative to gold, 
um, and uh, the miners have continued to barrel along at a pretty good rate. So, you know, year to date, uh, mining indices are up 20%, silver's up 12, and, and gold's up 8%. I, and we, uh, one of the things that I point out in the chart here is that in the when you get to the frothier stage of the market uh, on a rally, silver generally outperforms the gold market. And what we want to have at this point to have a sustained move is to watch the relative strength index on the silver gold ratio and as long as it doesn't get towards extremes then we've got a chance for this thing to continue to move along so um, we've got the chart there showing the examples of where uh, it became frothy in 2011 uh, at, the, at the high and the four subsequent points here so um, an item for people to keep an eye on um, and uh, it'll, it gives them the overview to things. And for people wondering where do we find the charts, it's on our website, talkdigitalnetwork.com. And I'll repeat that address at the end of the show for people, of course, who may not have a pen or pencil with them. Yeah. Crude oil, you know, we've, it's been trying to find stability at various levels coming down, you know, 55, 45, and uh, it looks as though we're st stabilizing here. The stocks are storing reasonable uh, buoyancy as well. They've held at or above the lows we put in December. This is very, very apropos to what we saw in the early stages of the basing in 2008. What does that tell people who are investing in the energy sector? Well, it says that uh, you can uh, you can start to step in uh, with a little bit of money, and seasonally it would be correct for that. Um, yeah, I think you still want to look at this as reasonably speculative as uh, we try and base out here because it does take typically two to three months to put the base in in terms of the oil market. So uh, don't, you know, don't overcommit and um, keep some stops underneath the recent lows. Thanks a lot for chatting with us, Ross. More than welcome. My guest has been Ross Clark, investment advisor at CIBC Wood Gundy in Vancouver. If you have any questions for Ross, his email is ross.clark at cibc.ca. Coming up next on This Week in Money, the Morgan Report founder, David Morgan. Always consult your investment professional before making any investment decision. This Week in Money is archived online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Our guest is David Morgan, editor and founder of The Morgan Report. Welcome to This Week in Money, David. Jim, good to be with you. Thanks. Precious metals are finally making a move. What's going to happen there? Yes, they've certainly made their moves. Uh, I'll be speaking at the Vancouver Resource Show here, actually, this weekend coming up. And what's going to happen in the metals? Well, the bottoms, I think, have been found late last year. Uh, silver actually hit, I think, 1415 intraday. Certainly, you couldn't buy it for that unless you're in the futures market and happen to be lucky to pick up a contract or two. Regardless, we were up today as we're doing this uh, interview, Jim, almost a dollar. Uh, silver's up 86 cents on the close, up 5%. Uh, gold is well off the you know, 12 25 breakout level, closed up again today at about 1280. So, uh, looks like the metals are certainly getting a nice lift into the uh, new year. Silver was lagging gold. Um, it may catch up here soon. The gold uh, moving averages are above the 200-day and 50-day. Silver uh, is approaching the 200-day moving average uh, and looking pretty strong here. How much longer this rally will continue is to be determined, but there are a lot of fundamental background factors that are very important and supportive of the metals prices not only here, but at, at higher levels as well. So lots to talk about in the metals. Uh, I don't want to get too overly enthusiastic with some pretty good-sized moves already, but certainly they're both very, very undervalued relative to where they could be basis, not only their fundamental value, but what their purchasing power is relative to their historic means and what's going on in the global geopolitical war slash uh, uncertainty factor. So there's a lot fundamentally and technically supporting the metals to move higher from here. And I think uh, 2015 is going to be a year where the metals are up year over year rather than down year over year. Sure. I mean, we're taking a look at uh, the currency markets with the Swiss franc up 17% in just two days because Switzerland has decided it is not going to support the euro anymore. People are flocking to put their money into Germany because they suspect Germany will bail from the euro and go back to the Deutschmark. 
With things like that happening, do precious metals become more precious and more valuable in, uh, in a number of ways? Absolutely. The you know gold is probably the ultimate currency, and with the uncertainty with uh, what's going on with you know the oil price level, what that's done to uh, major oil producers like Russia and Venezuela, what's happened with the Russian currency and now with the Swiss currency, uh, what the um, potential is for the euro. Uh, there's a lot going on in the currency markets. And one of the ideas that have been batted around by most of us that are, you know, Austrian school oriented or at least, uh, more open to why gold and silver are important in the financial realm have talked about a currency crisis or a currency war. Jim Rickards has a book called Currency Wars. And we have seen, I think, the beginning of it in a big way when you get, you know, one of the G7 involved, which is Russia. Uh, and now with uh, Switzerland, although Switzerland is relatively small in size and relatively small GDP, it's knowing for its banking acumen. And when it uh, decides it can no longer peg the Swiss franc at 120 to the euro, and that happened, I think it was 30% at one point during the day yesterday when they unpegged. So a lot going on, and this could uh, this portends other problems. I mean, for example, as you said, Jim, if you saw Germany go back to the mark or perhaps uh, Greece bails from the euro or the unraveling continues, let's say, I think it will spill over. And what's interesting is to note that gold is going up vis-a-vis -vis all currencies, including the dollar now. So what that shows is that uh, from the establishment point of view, that the gold and uh, the dollar are you know, always move opposite. Of course, that's not true. We know it's not true. But what it suggests is that the safety level of the dollar is being questioned by people moving into gold. So if you see gold moving up as the dollar is moving up, which we are witnessing, that is a clear indicator that the safest place to be is the gold market, not in any currency. And, of course, people have derided the actions of central banks around the world for supporting equities uh, to the, the degree that they have with billions and billions of dollars put into it. And as so many experts have told us, all you've done is delay the inevitable. You can't support the markets forever. And I've heard that they've been the most manipulated markets in history because of that. You're not really seeing a true picture. That's right. I mean, it's hard to say where they've done the most manipulation. I'd probably argue uh, interest rates because that – from the interest rates or the price of money, then everything stems. But regardless, uh, the point being that all these markets are pretty much manipulated and controlled. And because of that, you don't get a true picture. And to back you up on what you said, I mean, the stock market or the equities market is really supposed to reflect the physical economy. So if you look at an individual case-by-case, -case, company by company, you might get an accurate picture of you know how that company is doing relative to what it's doing you know in the real economy. For example, you might have uh, some type of 3D printing company, for example, that isn't overvalued. They probably are. I don't say that real closely, but it's selling you know, close to what it should be based on cash flow and its earnings and its future growth potential and all that. But that'd be like a case, and there's more than that, just single case. But what I'm saying is the general equity market is extremely overvalued by any basis you want to measure it by. So basis looking at stock prices in a general way, it would suggest that there's never been greater times out there in the real physical economy. I mean, this is just it's showing you, based on those metrics, things are fantastic. But if you look at the reality of what's going on, they're not. And so that's this very big discrepancy between stock valuations and the real physical economy. And it's at a point now where I think we're due to see it come down. Having said that, let me state that these markets can stay overvalued or undervalued for a lot longer than logic might dictate. I'm looking due to the oil price decline, what's going on in the currency markets, et cetera. I don't see a real huge uh, adjustment in, for the uh, situation at hand for probably, you know, five months or so. I know that sounds perhaps absurd because, you know, you can see it. But these markets are uh, have a lot of momentum, a lot of inertia, and they don't just turn on a dime because they are so big. So the oil market being one of the biggest commodity markets there, out there, the stock markets, et cetera. So I 
think it's possible that you could see overvaluations in the stock market for a few more months, and you could see uh, you know gold and silver certainly making their ways higher. But I don't expect to see like when a, a big move relative to the underlying fundamentals, probably until the fall. But I could be proven wrong, and you know I'm sorry, Jim, but I have to give a caveat, which I always do, and that's of course that's bar barring any you know unseen you know situations such as a terrorist event attack. Um, there's some black swan out there, uh, like Germany. I mean, Germany, you know, withdraws from the euro as an example. I think that'd be a big enough event that it would cause, you know, at least the disruption that the Swiss franc did when unpegging from the euro. What are you more bullish on, silver or gold? Right now, gold. Uh, the reason being um, that it's, you know, it's a better known, more establishment money, and it's still held by central banks. So even the bankers bad mouth gold, they really, in their heart of hearts, know its value, know why it's there, and they use it. And so that's and, and the value. In other words, uh, it's pretty tough to put billions of dollars into the silver market. I mean, it's such a tiny market. Whereas in the gold market, although tiny as it is, it's much, much larger than the silver market. And so that's the market that I think I'm more bullish on in the short term. And, that's, and I want to emphasize short term. In the long term, I'm more bullish on silver still. So the thing to do, of course, is watch the ratio. We had a you know 5% move in silver today and a 1.5% move in gold. So silver outperformed at about a 2 to 3 to 1 basis, which is what I like to see to really state that the silver market is starting to catch up. Um, I, but I really think one investor should own both the metals. Uh, there's different reasons why you would own one or the other, and owning them both makes sense. Also, that uh, again, longer term, I think you'll see the gold-silver ratio come down, which favors silver over gold. But gold has more stability; it's more readily accepted. So, depending on your age and risk, risk tolerance, uh, you can favor gold over silver, or you can favor silver over gold. Getting back to the oil market, I've heard you're very concerned about all the derivatives connected to oil and how these low prices could leave a lot of investors very vulnerable. Well, as pointed out, is the amount of derivatives in the oil sector is about double what it was in the housing sector. So the housing sector, of course, is what's largely blamed for the financial crisis of 2008. And now we're in a situation where we have derivatives exposure that is equal to or greater than, actually greater than what it was in real estate. And oil affects everybody, just like real estate affects almost everybody. But uh, so that's something, one, to be very aware of and concerned about. And again, there, there would be a delay. Uh, you know, the housing market didn't get overvalued like, you know, one day and all of a sudden the next day the, this bubble burst. I mean, they were writing these, you know, quasi-legal mortgages for a very long time. And the same thing with the derivatives in the oil sector. I mean, it the oil price just came down. But for that reality to wash through the markets where it's very apparent that these um, derivatives cannot be uh, continued, in other words, that the debt payment on these on these loans are absolutely impossible to pay. Uh, that will probably take oh, probably four or five months, but it's coming. And when it comes, just like in the housing derivatives problem, when it comes, it can be rather rapid decline in that sector. So I'm not saying that the oil price isn't down. That's obvious. What I'm saying is the derivatives that revolve around the oil sector, they have yet to reach uh, the reality of what, um, just like the housing market, of how uh, badly uh, financed these, these situations were. I mean, they are impossible to pay in many cases. Not all, of course, but a lot now, at the margin. The fracking industry, uh, pretty much as a whole, there's exceptions, of course. So big dislocations, misallocations, misallocations of capital, loans that really were not justified basis uh, anything other than an extremely high oil price. And now that high oil price is gone, they can't be justified. The market will figure that out. Are there other derivative markets that you're concerned about? Yeah, I think as concerned as I am about the oil derivatives, that uh, takes a big, big back seat to the major oil, uh, oil <laughs> to the major derivatives issues, and that's around interest rates. Interest rates, again, the price of money are the majority of the derivatives markets. And a lot of these are in big, big, big ways, not only bank to bank, 
uh, which is pervasive, but also bank to, say, large pension funds, large hedge funds, government entities, that type of thing. So, for example, uh, you might have a interest rate deal with a country like Argentina, as an example, or you know, you pick one, pick a favorite. And the idea being that um, some of these, let's call slick type of um, marketers, would suggest that, geez, look at interest rates are way down here. Wouldn't you like to protect yourself with these very low interest rates? And of course, that sounds good. You know, wouldn't you like to lock in your mortgage at a low interest rate? I mean, most people say, sure, yeah, I want to do that. So they lock in with one of these derivatives only to see interest rates move even lower. And then those investments, if you want to call them that, now don't look so good because their bet was they were locking in a low interest rate, and they're locked in. It's a, it's a contract, and now interest rates go lower. So there's a lot of that that's gone on the last several years. This is uh, one of several reasons why interest rates um, keep getting forecast or telegraphed, might be a better word, by the central banks, especially the Federal Reserve of the United States, that we don't see interest rates going up. We have this zip, the zero interest rate policy, continuing for a very long time. And this, of course, is the cardinal sin of, you know, borrowing short and lending long. You can check uh, Antel Fedeke's writing about that if you want to study it. But we're in a situation where I think this um, the interest rates is a far bigger problem. And, of course, all the banks are interconnected. So just because you are correct, you are the one that made one of these great loans to one of these countries that, you know, locked them into these low-term uh, rates, low interest rates, I should say, and interest rates have gone lower, and you probably have some control over that, doesn't mean that the counterparty is able to pay you back. And that's the problem, uh, because these debts are impossible to pay off. So since there's two sides to the story here, you know, who's going to pay it off? Well, they've been putting it on the back of the respective taxpayer, depending on whatever country it is. It's like, well, the bank can't pay, but we certainly can uh, make the citizens pay for the mistake, or for the bet, or for whatever you want to call it. And they're broke, too, you know, for the most part. So it's getting to the point, Jim, where I think this is the year, 2015, where a lot of this is going to come to the surface. Now, the spin that you'll get from the mainstream media, of course, is not going to be as straightforward as what I just described. There'll be all kinds of uh, obfuscation about, you know, what's happening and how it's taken place. And, you know, there'll be some scapegoats and some, you know, who knows, fun names, whatever, uh, that come to the fore, but the reality is that you cannot maintain the financial system on a zero interest rate policy forever, even though you might hear that from uh, very important sounding people with PhDs after their name. The truth is it will, won't work forever, and we're getting, I think, very close to where it's going to manifest. In fact, I think it's going to manifest, as I said, probably you know five months out, five months out from here. David, you're one of the guest speakers at the Vancouver Resource Investment Conference. What will people hear from you? Well, I'm going to focus on the metals, which I tend to do in those type of events. And I'm going to just, it's kind of a cute title, you know, gold and silver, or precious metals dead or alive. And I go through the fundamental and the technical work. And the answer is, of course, they're not dead. They are alive. And I go through several charts, making my point both technically and fundamentally why both these markets are far, far, far from over and build a case of why this should be a good year but perhaps not a great year and why it's going to be a great year in the years ahead, meaning in 2016, 17, 18, who knows exactly. But, you know, being a precious metals investor myself, certainly I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, higher prices in the metals. But in a way, I'm a bit um, remiss because, the world at large doesn't seem to be getting better as far as resolving these problems. And that's something that concerns me, is that even though, you know, you might uh, be hedged or protected or that type of thing, have a safe haven, so to speak, and that's well and good. But, you know, just because you individually or your family or whatever has a safe haven, which I encourage you to do, doesn't really protect you from a world financial system that is deteriorating more and more as this currency crisis deepens and deepens. So in a way, I'm glad to see the metals come up. But in another way, I'm a little saddened that um, 
there doesn't seem to be any real resolution to these problems. And that's unfortunate because we really need to get back on board um, some sound fiscal policy throughout all the sovereign nations and start working together in a way that uh, we can trust each other. The trust is broken down, obviously, and I think we'll continue to do so. And because the trust is breaking down nation state to nation state throughout the financial system from any angle you want to look at it, currency, stocks, bonds, whatever, that trust that's broken down will be redirected into the precious metals. And that's why I think you're going to see probably one of the biggest moves in to the precious metals because it becomes, excuse me, it becomes the safe haven of last resort. And we may just be seeing the beginning of that that may continue for the next, let's say, three years or so. David, how can people subscribe to your newsletter? It's quite easy. Just go to themorganreport.com. You can get on our free e-alert, which comes out every weekend. There's three levels of service that are described on the right-hand drop-down menu. You can go to our YouTube channel, which is Silver Guru, or the Twitter feed at Silver Guru 22 David, thank you very much for being on This Week in Money. My pleasure. Thank you. My guest has been David Morgan, editor and founder of The Morgan Report. Coming up next, James Corbett on This Week in Money. This Week in Money is archived online at talkdigitalnetwork.com. Welcome back to This Week in Money. We're speaking to James Corbett, an open source journalist who puts out The Corbett Report at corbettreport.com. And he also writes for The International Forecaster. Welcome to This Week in Money, James. Well, thank you so much for having me back on. It's always a pleasure to be here. And whereabouts are you talking to us from? I'm talking from a little city in rural Japan called Okayama that no one knows. It's about halfway between Osaka and Hiroshima. In other words, beautiful countryside, beautiful people? Uh, yes, actually, you're right about that. It's, uh, it's known for its hilly mountains and, uh, or the Japanese equivalent of mountains and some sunshiny weather and, uh, it grows nice peaches here in the summer. Beautiful. So kind of like Penticton. Yeah, not so far away, actually. Yeah, kind of similar. James, I think one of the big headlines that we want to take a look at, deflation has been a common thing that's happened in Japan, and now they're telling us that with the oil price drop across the world, perhaps it should be something that all of us should be thinking about. Well, it, it really should be, because it's going to affect absolutely every aspect of our lives one way or another, and it's not necessarily going to be a bad thing for everyone, like anything, like inflation or deflation, there are winners and losers, but it's certainly going to have a profound, and already is having a profound effect on the markets. And I think we can see this in a lot of different ways. Uh, and it's important to note that this, uh, obviously everyone's eyes are on oil, the oil price, because there are not only huge economic, but also geopolitical uh, ramifications to the oil price and, and now dropping under $50 a barrel. It's, it's almost unthinkable from where prices were just a few months ago. But uh, it's not just oil. I mean, it's iron ore, it's copper, it's a lot of different commodities we see uh, plunging right now. And this is obviously a uh, gathering deflationary undertow of the economy that I think has really been unleashed. I mean, let's let's uh, connect the dots here. It, we have to connect this to the end of the quantitative easing. Uh, uh, once the Federal Reserve started to wind that up, we started to see this plunging across the board. And I think that there is more than a little bit of uh, coincidence there. I think there is uh, some, some measure of causal relation there. So we've seen this tidal flood of quantitative easing over the past five or six years that has been propping up the economy with uh, or papering it over and we're starting to see the effects of what's really underlying this which has just been a lot of speculation and hype that has fueled booms that didn't deserve to be there in the first place and we're going to go through a connect or correction and this is obviously what's happening now the question is what's on the other side of this are we heading towards an even greater deflationary cycle and deflationary depression or are we heading into the opposite will we start to see that flood of money coming back into the markets and starting to see the inflationary effects of this tidal wave of money that's been created over the past five years. And I think that's still up in the air. But for, for now, certainly we are in this deflationary trend. I know the banks could be in trouble because they put out high interest loans to help fund the energy sector look for tough energy, like in the Alberta oil sands or drilling offshore. Will they be hit by this drop in oil prices? They certainly will, and they already are. And um, obviously, it's, again, it's not just oil, but obviously that is a big sector that the banks are invested in in a lot of different ways, not only through direct investments with loans, but also through derivatives. Um, there's obviously a lot of playing around in the oil futures markets that goes on. 
So th this is, again, going to have some significant effects as we start to see some of those deals unwinding. And just one that I was reading about recently involved Barclays and one other bank that I can't remember specifically, so I won't name, in uh, loans with uh, two specific oil companies that uh, just because of the falling oil price, it looks like they're only going to get 60 cents on the dollar for the loans, which is going to cost uh, something in the neighborhood of $300 uh, million just on those two loans alone. And this, of course, extended out over thousands and thousands of loans across the sector. In fact, there's an estimated 20,000 uh, small and medium hydrocarbon related uh, businesses in the United States, that all of which are going to be affected by this falling ice, uh, oil price. Because again, so much of the oil boom in the United States over the past few years has been enabled by high oil prices. We're starting to see some of the shale energy uh, producers starting to sh get shaken out of the markets now at these prices. So again, the ramifications just continue. And certainly for some of the banks that have invested and uh, loaned in, in these sectors, there is going to be a significant hit coming. And it could even be magnified depending on their derivatives positions. Has fracking helped Asian countries actually find energy on their own shores? Uh, not that I know of specifically. Certainly, I, I, I know about Japan, and I haven't heard of any such efforts in Japan. They, they may exist, but I don't know about them. Um, I'm not sure about el elsewhere in East Asia, but uh, I, I certainly haven't heard of an Asian oil production boom based on shale technologies. Maybe that's coming, or maybe that was coming, but uh, again, with falling oil prices, it just wouldn't make economic sense at this point. I know the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, China, were talking about forming their own World Bank to compete with the international World Bank as we know it. Have they been successful and are they doing it? Well, they, they are doing it. So the agreement was reached uh, back in, uh, I believe, August of last year, uh, where there was an agreement made to start the New Development Bank um, as well as the, uh, the, the CRA, um, the Contingency Reserve Arrangement. And basically, these are equivalent to the World Bank and the IMF, respectively, within the BRICS orbit, of course, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. So um, th this was, again, this was formed um, in the middle of last year, and uh, the, the, it's undergoing the process of capitalization right now. Ultimately, the, uh, the new development bank is going to have $50 billion uh, U.S. in subscribed capital, and the contingency reserve arrangement is going to have $100, uh, $100 billion liquidity pool, which might sound impressive, but compared to the World Bank's $232.8 billion in subscribed capital or the IMF's uh, $755 billion in liquidity or $1.4 trillion if you factor in emergency funds, it's really just a drop in the bucket. But still, it is, it is significant that this has been agreed to and is now in the process, as I say, of capitalization as the various uh, countries are kicking in the amounts that they've committed to. But of course, in the meantime, uh, these economic events are, are very much changing the financial landscape, especially, of course, for Russia, which is so heavily dependent on the oil price and is now starting to face some severe um, budget constraints and, and uh, other effects in its economy which are related to the sanctions and the falling oil price and a number of other hits that are coming. So it is certainly up in the air whether or not Russia is going to be capable of being a uh, an active supporter of this arrangement, which I think was really being spearheaded more so by China and uh, and is really being centered more around the, the Chinese influence in this uh, in this arrangement. How is China's economy doing right now? Uh, well, there are, uh, again, continuing signs of a slowdown, and last month's PMI figures uh, were the lowest in 18 months. So, again, there's more signs of uh, the actual manufacturing productive economy uh, slowing down, and that, of course, on top of a what has been exposed for a, a, some period of time now as a very unstable shadow banking system that underlies a lot of speculative uh, uh, wealth that has been fueled in recent years by a credit boom in in uh, China that's been fueled by the, the People's Bank of China. And every time they try to ease up on that credit boom, we start to see some uh, some money tightening. In fact, uh, we see some we saw a cash crunch not so long ago that that happened as a result of some some tightening that the PBOC tried to do. So I think there's uh, a, a, some inherent structural instabilities in China that really are being exacerbated by the sort of global slowdown that we're seeing on the back of this deflationary trend. And the latest manufacturing numbers really bear that out. So we're starting to see uh, China uh, paying paying the price for what's going on globally as demand starts to slow down. I saw an article that car dealers in China 
have been forced to buy so many cars a month by the car makers. And if, you know, if you have a 150 cars on the lot, you can't move and another 50 show up every month. A lot of hardship for them. Yes, uh, that's a- a- exactly right. I mean, again, with a command and control economy, you can only respond to the uh, changes that are happening, economically speaking, so fast. And certain dictates can come down, but it doesn't necessarily reflect the economic reality. And we see that in uh, in the car market in general in China and, of course, in Beijing, places like that, where, of course, uh, car ownership is still something of a luxury and has to be won through a type of lottery system to in- entitle you to uh, be allowed to, to own and drive a car in, in Beijing and, and other cities like that that are that are more controlled. So it is uh, it is obviously a, a manufactured market in a number of different ways. And again, as the as the general demand slows down and as the economy starts to go into a downturn, the uh, it's not so clear whether or not the PBOC will be in front of that and leading it or behind that and uh, lagging it and whether their policies are going to match up to the economic reality that the average Chinese person is experiencing. Dining out in China can be an interesting experience, so to speak. Food scandals have been rocking China now, I think, for about three years. Can you tell us about that? Well, not just three years, but yes, in the last few years, there have been some especially disturbing ones, and uh, there's even been the exposure of practices that have been around for for quite a long time, but that are just being really exposed and and brought to greater attention right now, including cattle being grazed in in garbage uh, dumps, uh, literally grazing on garbage, and then being used as meat. Uh, or having uh, uh, the gutter oil, um, so-called gutter oil being used for street vendors where basically it's uh, distilled from, from waste oil. Um, it's, and then of course, uh, fruit products are cooked in it. So these types of food scandals are, as I say, ongoing and have been for some time, but some of them coming to a head recently, including one at a uh, manufacturing plant for Yum Foods, which supplied KFC and Pizza Hut and uh, and uh, McDonald's and places like that, where meat was found in its, uh, at least one of their Chinese facilities to be uh, being scooped off the floor and uh, and uh, used and, and expired meat being used uh, for food products, and this caused a uh, a global sensation or at least an international sensation, especially here in Japan, where J- uh, McDonald's Japan has been feeling the, the the pinch as a result of this scandal. They, uh, the Chinese, uh, the, the Chinese manufactured McNuggets started to become a problem here. So what, uh, actually ended up happening is ch- uh, the ch- Japanese McDonald's had to issue an apology and we've seen McDonald's sales plummeting as a result here. So, uh, th- th- this is having start, uh, an increasingly international effect. Yes, I-, I believe the largest KFC in the world is in Beijing. It wouldn't surprise me if that were true. When I was in Beijing, I saw KFCs all over the place, and it was quite uh, quite sad to see the traditional culture, I think, being subsumed by the uh, the American conglomerate. But uh, I think that's just the way of the world these days. Farmers in India are upset about the low prices they're receiving, especially for cotton. There's been a wave of suicides, including at least one farmer who set himself on fire. Just how serious is that crisis? It's been ongoing for a number of years now, and I think there are waves and it uh, ebbs and and, uh, and rises in, in different uh, ways. But uh, this is, of course, related to the practices of uh, some of the, the giant uh, seed monopolies like uh, Monsanto that basically trap these farmers into uh, heavy debt burdens by uh, getting them to sign agreements for seeds that, of course, uh, they can't re-sow in, uh, in the next crop, and they end up becoming indebted to these companies and ultimately killing themselves. And I don't have the uh, the figures right in front of me in terms of how many people this has affected overall or how many in, in recent years, but it has been an ongoing phenomenon that's been reported on by a, uh, a number of outfits over, over the recent years and certainly paid a, a devastating toll on a lot of the farmers in, in India specifically. A lot of chatter there now, I believe, about global taxation. Can you tell us about that? Yes, well, this is a story that I'm I'm following because it is it is, it is developing right now, but um, very much under the radar. There's not a lot that's being reported on it, but we can pick it up from some scattered stories, including um, one from, for example, from February of 2014. The Business Standard was reporting on G20 agrees on automatic tax data sharing talking about the G20 nations uh, uh, basically approving a OECD initiative, which includes 34 OECD countries 
including the U.S., the U.K., Germany, Japan, all of the main countries of the industrialized world, uh, working on plans to exchange information to crack down on tax avoidance, presumably to crack down on the billions that are being stored offshore by various uh, you know, multinational corporations. Of course, this also affects individuals, and what we're seeing is the creation of the framework for the data sharing on individual personal da- bank accounts and personal information between countries, and it's, uh, it's a growing net. And I believe that number of countries that are participating in this is now up to uh, in the 50s, the last time I saw this reported on last month. And uh, this, this really is, I think, the infrastructure for what would be needed for a global tax uh, system. And obviously, this is not being called that, and it's not being presented in that way. But as I say, I think this is the infrastructure that's needed. And I think the, the single country that's probably doing the most to further this right right now is the United States, which, as people may or may not know, recently uh, launched the International Data Exchange Service as part of its Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, uh, being uh, be, being um, uh, spearheaded or, or uh, run by the IRS. And under this, we, we now have 145,000 financial institutions around the world have signed on to, uh, to basically provide data on their clients to the IRS as part of a tax data sharing arrangement. And this is, I mean, this is fascinating because of the amount of, of the mind boggling bureaucracy that's involved in this, including banks and financial institutions in uh, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus and Abkhazia and other states that aren't even officially recognized by the United States, and yet their their inst- financial institutions are being forced to comply and, and share data with the IRS if they want to have anything to do with U.S. customers. So uh, ag- again, this is uh, a mind-boggling project that's really being constructed, but mostly behind the scenes. And this is Again, the type of uh, infrastructure, the type of system that's needed to be in place for the idea of some sort of global tax to be feasible, and I think that's that's what we should be keeping in mind with this story is the uh, is what can be enabled through this type of structure. My big concern would be if I was a U.S. citizen or Chinese because they have the same law where they tax people who live overseas, is that. If they have economic problems or their banks have problems back home, they could dip into my bank account to help settle the problem. That's exactly right. Again, this really starts to wed the financial uh, infrastructure of the world into into one big web, and it does allow the IRS or the Chinese equivalent to reach its fingers into parts of the globe that it formerly had nothing to do with. So it is an incredible financial power uh, that that is being created behind the scenes. And again, most people won't even know this is going into place. And a lot of other people will say, well, I don't live overseas, so it won't affect me. But uh, I think this really does start to raise some troubling questions about what could be possible in the future. For example, if there was a global carbon uh, carbon taxing agreement that was that was created, this would this would create the possibility for compliance with that, whether whether you're ready for that or not, and uh, through some sort of global body, perhaps one that's set up by the United Nations. This is the type of thing that people have been warning about for for decades, generations even, and we see the infrastructure now actually going into place. Of, and of course, it's not going to be sold to the public as the, the the undergirding for a global tax system, but that's exactly what it what it is and what it could be used for. Of course, the conspiracy people have been saying for years, you know, they're trying to form just one world government so that your vote at home doesn't mean anything. You think this will fuel them? Well, I I uh, I, I don't know if I can speak to uh, conspiracy theorists as a whole, but certainly I ha- uh, do see the the overall trend is towards. Uh, uh, cooperation amongst uh, nations on a financial level, which again le- wields uh, an incredible amount of power um, when when those uh, when that is grouped together in a, in a political uh, towards a political agenda. And so I think at this precise moment, obviously, this isn't being used for that purpose. But again, it could be coalesced depending if the political motive uh, motive was there. Uh, for the UN or some other body to start uh, some sort of global tax compliance scheme. So again, the infrastructure is there, and that's not debatable. The only question is, 
whether this will ever be used for that. And I think if uh, if people have studied history, they know that if a, if a power exists, if a political power exists, there is more than likely someone who's going to step into that vacuum to try to wield it, which is why I think this is an important story that more people should be following. People in Vancouver are wondering about what they call the empty apartment syndrome, where investors from China have bought three or four condos, maybe 10 in one building, but nobody lives in them. Do they talk about it? And what's their goal? Well, yes. I mean, here's uh, this is the interesting part of some of these markets, which are now predominantly or at least increasingly uh, dependent on on these international buyers. It's not just, for example, uh, Chinese investors in in Vancouver, but uh, you, of course, you have the Russian oligarchs who've uh, created the incredible, incredibly expensive housing market in London and places like this. But we see that a lot of that's starting to unwind now. Obviously, a lot of Russian oligarchs trying to get their money back out um, and uh, trying to find somewhere uh, safer to park it as the Russian economy starts to tank. And uh, you start to see some of these Chinese uh, uh, looking for ways to get out of uh, what looks to be a very shaky Chinese economy. So you start to see some uh, greater investment in places like Vancouver. Uh, the interesting part of all of this is, of course, uh, people have been noting for years now that the, there is a Canadian housing bubble, and the, the experts have been talking for some time now about how it's going to be probably a soft landing and we're going to see a, a, a nice gentle correction. But there are some markets right now, like, for example, Calgary, that are experiencing some very sharp, very uh, short, uh, short term, very sharp corrections right now. So, for example, home prices just dropped the most in two years over the past uh, two months. We just saw the the Calgary Home Price Index drop precipitously, and uh, it has, I think, a long way to go to get back towards where it was back in the 2011-2012 range. But it is turning downwards, as you would expect, of course, right now, given the uh, the downturn in the oil economy, which of course is so tied into to what's happening in Calgary. But, uh, but tie that into the overall debt-to-income picture in Canada, and you're starting to see a very worrying picture because, of course, the o- overall household debt-to-income ratio in the United States was growing in line with Canada uh, during that early part of the 2000s where they were both, both of them crossed over that 100% threshold, so more than 100% uh, of the income was, uh, was held in debt. And uh, and that started to correct after the 2008 Lehman collapse and, and in the United States, and now it's uh, it's gone back down significantly since its uh, 2007 2008 high. In Canada, that that ratio continued to climb. So now you have 160 percent debt to income levels, and I think that is another. A very, very significant figure that if we start to see the type of overall correction that's happening right now, deflation generally speaking, and in oil and in in other commodities, when that starts to affect housing prices, as it already is in Calgary, you could see a a very significant and very sharp downward correction uh, in the housing bubble in Canada. So I think uh, if Chinese investors were really looking for a better place to to go out of the country with their money, probably uh, the Vancouver housing market might not be the best place for them to be doing so. I'm also wondering, we called it the Japan syndrome. In the early 80s, Japanese investors bought a lot of real estate in Vancouver. Then when the Japanese economy had a downturn, the first thing they did was sell all their Vancouver properties at fire sale prices. Would the Chinese investors here do the same thing if things get tight in China? Uh, Yes, I think so. I mean, I think that's exactly what we can expect. Obviously, there's been a lot of things that have been geared towards this idea that the Chinese economy is just blistering and will continue to be so. But uh, I mean, again, I think there's a lot of indications. Not only do we have actual indications that the manufacturing, for example, is slowing down demonstrably, but uh, obviously also that the the, the credit boom that's fueled uh, economic growth in the last few years is starting to, to unwind as well. So I think there is there are reasons to be concerned that uh, th- this type of unwinding is going to happen in the Chinese economy, and uh, I think it it, w- it won't look I-, I think exactly like what happened in Japan, but uh, the the effects of it I think will be similar, and we'll we'll obviously start to see uh, a, just an overall decrease in international investment by Chinese investors. James, anything else you think we should cover right now? I think we've covered an awful lot, um, uh, but again, I think just what we're seeing right now is absolutely uh, going to fundamentally transform the, the markets as we've known them over the past several years when we talk about this deflation, and probably the most significant effects 
uh, for a lot of people are going to be the geopolitical effects, which I have no doubt we're going to start to see in uh, 2015. We already saw some pretty interesting developments in 2014 with the Russian sanctions and and then, of course, the uh, the battle over the South Stream pipeline of Russian energy to Europe and how that ultimately got cancelled and Russia now trying to start a pipeline with Turkey. Uh, that's probably going to get, uh, if not cancelled, at least postponed because of the falling oil price. So, again, there's going to be a lot of geopolitical movement this year, and I think we'll have to keep an eye on the markets to understand which way that's going to fall out. One of the oil experts told me Russia might be eyeing some of its uh, some of the former Soviet states in the south where oil is very cheap to produce because they have expensive oil to produce just like Canada does. Would uh, Putin think about that? Well, I, I think it's extremely important to think about what uh, Russia is doing right now with some of its former Soviet uh, Republic partners, including the uh, the launch, as probably a lot of people don't even know happened earlier this, uh, this year, but there was the launch of the European Economic U- Union, um, which uh, was su- supposed to be for years, Putin has been hyping this as uh, a world historically important thing that's going to be happening. Uh, in, and and now that it has actually arrived, it looks like it's probably dead on arrival. Um, this is uh, uh, basically an economic union that, that binds Kazakhstan and Armenia and uh, and some of those those that that area in, in Russia's backyard together in a, a, what's supposed to be a type of European Union counterpart or something that's supposed to look like that at least in terms of ec- ec- economic effects right now. It's supposed to be a free trade area. Um, however, what we're seeing, of course, with Russia's economy tanking is that even the partners who are now committed to this and are now actually signatories and involved in it, let alone the partners who are thinking about committing, like Tajikistan and others, uh, they're they're basically starting to, to uh, if not heads for the exits, at least downplay the significance of this. And uh, interestingly enough, although this is supposed to be a tariff-free area that they're setting up, of course, that excludes hydrocarbons <laughs> because, of course, the Russians want to uh, to parlay their their uh, their hydrocarbon advantage as much as possible. So there's going to be, I think, some some economic and geopolitical wrangling between these nations um, when it comes to such things as uh, energy. And uh, it's, again, that's going to be extremely interesting to see how that plays out this year, especially now that the Euro- Eurasian Economic Union has been created. Of course, B.C.'s long-term plan is to sell natural gas to China. If they get supplies from Russia, will they need Canadian natural gas? Well, I I guess uh, it would certainly not as much. Um, But again, uh, that's all quite speculative at at this point. Um, We'll we'll certainly have to see because, again, what's what's taken place between Russia and China last year with the signing of their their gas agreements was was extremely important and potentially extremely important, including uh, the the idea that this uh, this new uh, uh, pipeline is going to ship 38 billion cubic meters of gas a year uh, down to China from Russia. That would obviously have a huge effect on on China's importing and uh, where it's going to source its imports from. But the question is, will this this idea that this will be online by 2018, will that be feasible in this environment with the plummeting oil price? And it's not at all clear that it will be. Uh, This idea of a power of Siberia pipeline has been estimated at $55 billion uh, in terms of uh, overall cost, but it's difficult to see the uh, the ability to complete that in this current uh, uh, market in, in with the current oil price point. So, again, there's uh, there's questions surrounding these deals and whether or not uh, China will be able to rely on Russia as a partner um, in the near future. I think long term, I think they are committed to this, but it's a question whether they'll be able to put in the infrastructure fast enough for, for China. And as the Ukrainians found out the hard way, Russia will turn off the gas. It happened to them twice in the middle of winter. I think maybe some Chinese investors might be worried about that, too. I think they have to be. And I think uh, there is a tendency uh, sometimes amongst the media to portray Russia and China really as two peas in a pod and, and friendly. But I think they have their own economic rivalry, certainly. And they, they certainly also have geopolitical rivalry going back quite a while, half a century now. So I don't think that their relationship is 100 percent comfortable, even if they are committed in various ways through the BRICS and uh, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and others. They are certainly forming closer ties but there is always the possibility that Russia will use some of its uh, energy leverage or China will use some of its economic leverage. And we could see 
some disputes or even falling out between those two parties. So nothing is ever certain in the geopolitical arena, and uh, this relationship is no different. James, can you maybe tell us how people can subscribe to your newsletter? Absolutely. Well, if you go to CorbettReport.com, all of my podcasts and videos and articles are available for free viewing on, on the website, so I hope people will check that out first. If they do like the work that I'm doing, they can support it by subscribing, and uh, you get the weekly newsletter and a monthly subscriber-only video. And you also get to sign into the website and leave comments on the various posts that, that are up there so people can find details on, uh, on that on CorbettReport.com. And of course, they can also subscribe to the International Forecaster, specifically that newsletter at TheInternationalForecaster.com. Thanks again for speaking to This Week in Money. Thank you very much for having me on. My guest has been James Corbett, an open source correspondent who has his own newsletter, The Corbett Report, at CorbettReport.com. He also files for the International Forecaster. Well, that wraps up our show for this week. You can find the charts that Ross Clark was talking about at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Thanks to our guests, Ross Clark, David Morgan, and James Corbett. And thank you for listening. I'm Jim Goddard. We're back next week with more This Week in Money. This Week in Money is a production of Howe Street Media Incorporated.